Hey, this is Darwin Garrison from Garrison Nerd Room, and this video is going to cover our modification of the LEED 1010 CNC router machine. We're going to add a couple inches of space between the uh, spoiler board and the tool head. So the LEED 1010 from Open Builds is a three-axis CNC position system. It can be used with routers, plasma cutters, lasers, vinyl knives, anything that you need a three-positional system to locate your action head. So as produced by Open Builds using the stock 250 millimeter 40 by or 20 by 80 vertical bars here, you get about two inches of board clearance. We're, the way we're going to use this, we're going to use tooling boards that mount to this board. So this is not actually a spoiler board. This is actually a tool board. By doing that, I've eaten up 12 millimeters of my space that the bit can't go into. And I also wanted a little bit more room between my bit and the clamps so that I didn't have any head crashes when the bit ran into it. So we're going to change these verticals right here from 250 millimeters to 300 millimeters and they'll buy us basically another two inches of clearance head space and this C-beam is capable of eating that up without additional reinforcement because this is really rigid. They just built on what they had as stock parts as opposed to custom cutting apart for more head clearance and left it to the people who would build the systems to adjust it to their own use. Okay, so I mentioned before that as standard, these come in 250 millimeters with the, st the stock 1010. Open Builds actually has a kit that will replace this 250 with the 500, and it adds an additional crossbar uh, to give you a full eight inches of throw. But that's really overkill for what we're gonna be using it for, and it physically take up a lot of space. So rather than going down that road, I'm gonna take this V-slot, which comes in 500 millimeter lengths, there's two pieces in this package, and I'm gonna chop them off at about 300. And then you can see that'll give us our two inches. Um, so what we're doing here is we're weighing out our measurement before we go to the chop saw and making sure that we get this set. Now 300 millimeters actually turns out to be just about 12 inches within a couple of sixteenths or within a sixteenth or in three thirty seconds or something. So we're just gonna make it 12 inches because God damn it, this is America. So, uh, just set up your trusty square, make sure that you're lined up with your line with no parallax, make your first little scratch, and then set your square. Make sure you get it lined up and make line. And you might be thinking that I'm going overboard here, but I'm not entirely sure how this thing's going to line up with the chop saw, so we're just going to scratch it all the way across the top. And do it again with this piece. Try to be consistent which end you work off of, it keeps things from getting confused. Now this is not like I'm machining engine heads or anything, but the closer it can be to identically the same, the better for everybody concerned. Huh. Piece of right there, there's a piece of punching flash that keeps you from making a straight line. Now, I am told by Open Builds that you can cut 20 by 40 or any of their C beam or whatever aluminum V-slot components with a chop saw. So what I have here is my trusty Delta 10 inch chop saw that's been around for years and years and a brand spanking new 80 tooth uh, non-ferrous metals and plastics apparently saw blade. 
It's carbon toothed, but it, it's the best that China can offer, which is kind of middling. So we're gonna give it a shot and see what happens when you drop this blade and this motor on top of a piece of aluminum. Now, I'm not entirely sure I trust this thing. So I, when I've cut wood before, I felt things walk as I cut through them. And a lot of guys use clamps and so forth. And I'm not that advanced. I think these things here are for clamps that I don't have. So I'm going to use a manual clamp on this and lock it in place after I adjust where I want the blade to hit. So the, blade, the saw is unpowered. I'm going to bring this down and check out where the teeth land. Right about there. Parallax. Okay, so there it is. That's where I want it. And now, God help me, I'm going to clamp it. Just to be extra safe. I hope it's safe. I hope it doesn't explode in my face. And I think I'll go get another clamp. Okay, well, I got my other clamp on it. We've got it backed up against the back guard. Blade seems to be lined up, so I'm going to go ahead and ruin a bunch of money. I want to hold your ears for this. Well, that was kind of a non-event. Okay, so let's see how close we were. Dead on. It actually covers the line up perfectly. I thought I'd overcut it, but it's actually, I guess when that blade hits and the metal disappears, it scares the bejesus out of you, but we're good to go. Well, okay, so there it is. Uh, I now have two essentially identical pieces of metal in length, 300 millimeters long, and a whole bunch of aluminum chips everywhere. So I'm going to sweep this up and then we're going to move on to the 1010 disassembly so that we can put these new pieces of wonder in the machine and get our extra headspace. Okay, so we've got our extra long pieces of metal here. Gets us our two inches. In order to use it, this beam has to come off. And uh, these wires also have to be loosened up to allow for two inches. And back here is the extra wire that we'll need. So this has to be cut loose. This has to be loosened right here so that this uh, snake chain can float while we're doing this work. And then we'll have to pull these plates on either side. And then there's four of these cast brackets on each side that have to come off. With that, the entire thing will loosen. We can just set it back. We don't have to go after the C-beam that has the router, and we don't have to do anything to the C-beam that it controls our X-axis, because we're not changing that, which is a difference from what the open build system is. You have to replace the C-beam because it gets really tall. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started by removing the router first, and then I'm going to undo the wire and unhook this and then start disassembling that. Well, I 
went to unscrew this piece here and come to find out that the Allen head is wallered out. So I can't get a two millimeter hex to work in there. So I got to break out this handy dandy pliers and take off the nut directly. Okay, so there it is, it's loose. Um, I had forgotten about the bracket on the back, but that's held with just one of the blind nuts, so it came off right away. Now we're gonna have to go after the Y-axis and get one end loose somehow, so that we can get the uh, carrier, the cart off of each one and rebuild the cart with the new part, so. Okay, so last, scene I was talking about how I was going to have to tear down the y-axis to change out this bar and you'll notice this bar has changed. That bar is not. The reason is that I wanted to try something and I tried it and you don't have to tear down the y-axis. You can loosen up the screws. You can actually use a ball driver or a uh, Allen wrench and they're perfectly acceptable as long as you tilt everything up to get at and then you can just slip it apart and put it back together again. It was really easy. I was surprised. So, uh, but now that I've got this off, I can show you the difference between the two pieces right there. The original one is here and then the new one is here. So there's your two inches of gain in the head side. So with that said, now we're going to do that side so that you can see what I did. So uh, the first thing to do is to lift this up so you can get at the screws on the bottom side of the carriage. And uh, since it's all together, all you really have to do is just pick it up and put something underneath it. And then it's in the air. So there's these cast brackets on the back and then four screws, one, two, three, four, to get this off. And it's really not that big of a deal because these four screws here are threaded into the adapter plate. One, two, three, and four is right here. Now one thing I've noticed is that my touch probe is in the way, so I'll move this off to the side, which won't hurt anything. Now, okay, so those four are loose. This thing, the only thing it's holding up are these screws and the slip nuts that go in the channels there. So because you have some space here, you can actually get a ball driver. Well, you could. That one's not going to work so good. So. What you need is a three millimeter Allen head wrench and you can get on that screw on the bottom, which was the one that was almost having me take everything apart. You can't see it because I'm doing this all by feel and we're not good enough with the camera yet. And you don't have to take it apart. You just have to loosen it. It just has to be rattle loose. That's the important thing, is you don't really want to take it apart, you just want to loosen it. And once you get it all rattled loose, then it'll just slide out. So, there's that one. And this one is, uh, that. this has been heavily used putting the thing together, so it's not too surprising that it's kind of gotten a little bit wore. All right, see you there? There you go.
Okay, so I went ahead and I transferred the hardware to our new one. Um, it's just need to tighten this a little bit so it doesn't wiggle around on me. Um, these are set back so that I can slide this up and down. These are the slide nuts, the T-nuts, that go into the V-slots here. And by pushing those forward and getting them away from the plate, I can slide this down over those T-nuts. And do the same... Ooh. And the bottom ones are the tricky ones. There's one, and there's two. Okay, so now those are all in the slot. There we go. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just snug the tops up a little bit. Okay, so now what this allows me to do is adjust this plate so that it is completely flush along the bottom. Because in when you first build it, you set this on a tabletop, and it's easy. Here you have to kind of feel it with your fingers, lightly tighten those up, and still leave enough give that you can adjust it up and down without it slopping back down again. This takes a little bit of fiddle. We'll talk about fiddle in a minute more about adjusting the wheels on the bottom. It's a really good time to do that when you get it up after you've made a mistake like I did. Okay, so I've got this adjusted so I'm not feeling a stair step either direction on the bottom here. I'll go ahead and snug these top ones down and then I'll, sn I'll snug the bottom ones And double check it one more time. Yeah, that's pretty good. So now I go back with the Allen, the Allen wrench and I actually put a little bit of torque on it. It doesn't have to be, you don't go crazy on this thing. It's uh, not like it's... I mean, you keep an eye on it as you use the machine to see if the vibration of the router or anything does damage to your torque, but these things are not, it's not like an engine where you're worried about continuous vibrations and asynchronous stuff. It's all pretty smooth. Okay, and with that, that's torqued. So now what I can do is I can loosen this up. So that it slides up and down. Get one of my 10 millimeter, 3 millimeter bolts here. 10 millimeters long, 3 millimeter diameter, whatever they are, fives I guess they are. That's what they say. What you do is you just lightly snug one up and then you lightly snug the other up and get everything nice and square before you go honking down on stuff. And you can do this with, <laughs> I really do appreciate Open Builds providing us with these to build the machine. By the time you get done though, they tend to want to lock into the screws and not let go. So I may switch this out for my Allen wrench here directly. Depends on how frustrated I get. And do this again. Now we, in the manufacturing community, actually have a term for this. If you put things together crooked and torque them down, you have what's called induced strain. And that can cause things to be crooked and not work right. It can cause premature failure. Okay, gonna do the backside now. 
So that's why you have torque patterns when you're putting together heads or covers or things like that. And you do it in steps to give everything a chance to normalize so that everything's nice and square before you hang, really hand the torque down to the fastener. There's a whole discussion about torque too. I've learned a lot about torque working for an engine manufacturer and uh, theories of preventing fasteners from coming loose and stuff and uh, torque's rather critical. Okay, so mild interruption there. Sorry for the jump in the video. And in my monologue about torque. And the, the funny thing about torque is that in model airplanes for like mounting motors and stuff like that, you can't really get a true locking torque on the fastener if you're up against like wood because the wood won't sustain it. You have to have a metal to metal joint. So there's that. Now the other thing I've got to do that I forgot to do earlier. I got to get these little doohickeys right here off. Okay, so that's the plan. This is up. It's at the same height because it's level across here. We have installed our uprights. It's now a matter of, uh, I'm going to take a little side step. We're going to adjust the wheels on the bottom here. And then uh, we're going to go ahead and put the crossbar back on. Okay, so um, in posting about my build of the 1010 on the Open Builds discussion forum, I found out that I was adjusting the wheels too tight on the carrier. Um, they're supposed to be adjusted to the point where they're, you just take the play out of the carrier. You don't crank it down until the wheels are practically squeaking when you move them. So uh, I already did the other side and I've done the x-axis and the z-axis. I'm just going to walk through doing this axis just so it's documented somewhere so if anybody has a question they know what to do. Okay, so for doing this you need a uh, mechanics mirror, which is better than sticking your head underneath the machine. This uh, pen light is real handy for shining in the mirror and seeing what you're doing. And then you need the open builds cam adjustment tool for adjusting the tension on the wheel. Um, for those of you who've built these or are thinking about building them, the bottom wheels are on an eccentric spacer. It's basically the holes drilled off center in the spacer so that as you crank uh, the hex shaped knurl around it moves the axle up and down as that center moves in and out. The tops are fixed. You can't do anything about the tops. They are what they are. You don't even worry about how much force is on the wheels on top. The only thing you're worried about is the contact of the wheels on the bottom of the rail. And you want to bring it up to the point where the wheel touches and the slop is gone. There's no rattle in the upper thing. You do not want to go beyond that. You just want it to be zero lash. If you get it too tight, then what happens is the uh, motor will give an input. The screw may not move as much as, you, as the motor thinks it moved or it may lag, it take time. And as you're trying to traverse back and forth, you lose position on this side versus that side. So at the end of a run, this side will stop at a place different from that side. And that tells you that you're effed. So, um, and since this is a two motor system, they're not using like one lead screw and a carrier on the bottom to move it forward and back. You've got to have the minimum amount of resistance so that the input of both motors results in an identical distance movement forward and back. So too much force means too much friction, means one side or the other doesn't keep track with the other one. So the way this works, on the bottom, and if you've followed the 1010 build, you know there's a six millimeter stamp on the nuts. So the first thing you do is get that six millimeter stamp down again, if you made the mistake like I did. So I have to go under here and I'm gonna move them in the same direction. One click at a time until I get 
and I'm moving them both because I don't want to get the axle canted bent because you can put enough mechanical force in there now let's see here yeah I'm almost there is that right yep there it is there's the six and what about the other side I need to bring it down there it is okay so I've got my six pointing down on the front axle so if I reach under here and I touch these these are free floating they are not touching the bottom so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this all away because I don't need sight anymore I need feel and I will move each side the same until I get contact It's real easy to tell when you get contact because it goes from just being free spinning and suddenly it just stops. It's, it's hit. If you can get on the hex. Okay, so one of them is actually touching. The other one isn't. There we go. So then you just back it off until you've got just... Yeah, you try to find the point where it really grabs. Not hard. It's the difference of like half a hex, if that. And take the time to fiddle with it until you've got the absolute least amount of involvement. Now then, once you feel, think you've got it, you come up here and you test. And if you can't feel any um, offset or movement here, that's good. So, minimum amount of friction. They should be about the same as near as you can tell. And if it's not, if it's not moving this relative to that, which it's not, you're good to go. So I'm going to do the back one now. So, um, got that over there, dropped it, centered everything back up so the machine is right where I want it. Now it's time to put the uh, X and Z axis back where they belong. I've, I've set up these brackets and I pushed them in so there's plenty of room and they're kind of loose. So basically what it comes down to is recreating the steps that were here before where we set this back on to the uprights and drive in the two self-tapping screws on each side and then put these brackets back where they belong and the ones on the back as well. So, I'm um, going to make sure that that's upright and the other one's upright. And then we're going to go ahead and pick this bad boy up and just kind of roll it forward and set it in place. And if all goes well, then the rear bracket is right back where it belongs, which this one didn't. There we go. All set there. Walk over now, you notice that it's not falling off, which is a good sign. The balance is such that it tends towards that side. And because we're re-tapping these holes, and what's really interesting is this is nice and flush, and that's nice and flush, so we're actually in really good shape here. Yep, looking real good. So, Got our two self-tapping screws. Run those bad boys down. Okay, so that's good. Go to the other side. We've got our two self-tappers right here. Make sure everything's lined up, which it is. There we 
we go. I gotta use my right hand. Oh, doesn't like me. There we go. Okay, so after that, I wanna go ahead and set our five millimeter screw in back here. Get this other five millimeter screw. Okay. And then we do the four there and the four here. Well, here we are. Um, it's done. We have the higher vertical here, and that gets me, you know, my full four inches that I wanted. So we're in good shape. The rollers have been readjusted. Uh, the only thing that's left is attaching this wire set, and frankly, that's going to be kind of trivial. Um, I just need to get a new screw for that, and then I need to reset my position switch there per the instructions from the open build set which I don't remember off the top of my head so I'm gonna to have to look at it. In our next uh, video about the 1010 we'll be actually cutting some foam on a new tool board designed for this lockdown plate. So hang with us and we'll see you next time.